Amen. Well, what a great day uh, yesterday, hearing all that God's doing around the world, all that Jesus is doing. And um, I don't know about you, but I said this phrase at a recent event like this, where I said, I sit here and feel wonderfully small. <laughs> the wonderful side is that God's at work in ways we could never even imagine, above and beyond we could ask or think. And Oh, here's a little old me over here, Lord. Is there anything I can do to be a part? But the reason God's doing so many amazing things is because everybody's doing their part, right? That's how the kingdom of God works. Um, before I jump into this morning's message, um, uh, one of the questions I often get asked now, uh, being from Waco, Texas, it used to be, do you know where the Branch Davidian compound is? Um, <laughs> That has shifted in the last five years is, do you know Chip and Joanna Gaines and Fixer Upper? How can we buy a house or can they come to our house? That's, so these are the two things I'm usually known for addressed uh, in conversation. Uh, but just for reference, uh, Chip and Joanna are dear friends. They are a part of our church. They're not able to be as publicly involved as they have in the past. But I do want to say this, they're the real deal. They love Jesus. They want to be right with God. They want to be right with people. It's a challenging journey. Always pray for them like all of us. They're fruitful but fragile. They would uh, solicit, desire your prayers and all things. But many times people wonder about their whole faith journey and where they are. And I did an interview with them a couple of years ago. It's on YouTube. I think we've got a little slide over here. It says, an interview with Chip and Joe at Antioch. And the only reason I uh, kind of advertise this when people ask me about it is because we share the gospel. We ask about their whole faith journey, who they are as followers of Jesus, and then I give everybody a chance to respond to the gospel. And I always encourage people when they say, hey, I really want to know about their faith. That's for us as believers. But please, please, please pass this on to anybody who doesn't know Jesus, any of your friends who love the show but don't know why. This is kind of the behind-scenes look that gives a clear presentation of the gospel for them to be, for people to respond and be saved. And we have story after story after story of people who've watched their life or watched this interview and given their lives to Jesus. So another little opportunity there uh, for Jesus to be glorified in and through this phenomena, crazy thing uh, that's going on uh, through their lives. Um, well, I want to just take you a little into my own journey and Laura's and my journey of faith and giving and and uh, generosity because it intertwines into everything that uh, Jesus has been doing in us over the last 32 years. Um, I, I kind of go, always go back to a uh, time in college where as a new believer I was coming into the things of God. I was asking the right questions. God, how do I love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength? How do I love my neighbors and myself? And as I looked around again as a new believer not growing up in the church, I was a little disappointed People would say these scriptures, but I didn't know many people that were living wholeheartedly for Jesus. So through a number of circumstances, one summer I decided, I'm going to find out who Jesus is on my own. And I said, I'm going to start in the book of Matthew, and whatever Jesus says, I'm going to do, and whatever Jesus did, I'm going to do. Now the only problem is, I had not read through the Gospels yet. Uh, that's quite a deal. I'm a fairly strong-willed, resolved guy, so like I was in, I'm going to do it. And I jokingly say, by chapter 6, I had uh, forgiven everybody I hadn't planned on forgiving. Uh, I had given away just about everything I had. And my life was being changed by the simple words of Jesus. <laughs> Somebody said yesterday, hey, you really hit the mark. I said, man, when you talk about Jesus, you're always on point. He's always the exact representation of the Father to us, his way, his life, how he did life is what we're invited into. So here were some interesting scriptures that, that hit me in those early days. Uh, Matthew 5, 42, give to him who asks of you and do not uh, turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Now I grew up uh, in that great scripture, God helps those who help themselves. And my stuff was my stuff. And so I read this scripture and I thought, oh my goodness, right? So I began to do it. I began to tithe for the first time. And I just began to, if anybody asked for anything, I remember um, they, I was watching TV and they had uh, like Compassion International came on and asked you to support a child. And they said, and my deal was they asked, I give. So I started supporting a kid and, and just jumped right in because I wanted to just respond to the scriptures. Well, if Matthew 5 wasn't already getting the ball rolling, Matthew 6 
Starting verse 19, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, but store up for your, uh, where thieves and moths destroy and steal, but store for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. And uh, I had started taking the Wall Street Journal in high school, had started investing, and was a business major, was going to go to law school and go into politics. So that was my trajectory. And I read this scripture, and I thought, oh my goodness, treasure in heaven, investing in heaven versus just investing in earth. You know, I think an investment on earth, man, if you get 20% return, that's pretty good. Do that all day long. If you get 10, still do it. Even if you get five, still do it. But I thought if I invest in the kingdom of God, it's a hundredfold return. Immediately, it can't be stolen. Anything that is sown by the Spirit reaps from the Spirit. Anything that is sown into the kingdom, it can't be taken away. And it's eternal. It's forever. So I thought, just common sense, I'm going to start investing in the kingdom instead of investing in this world. Why would I not want a hundredfold return versus a temporal return in this earth? And so that changed things immediately in the way that I not only was just responding to need, but then say, how can I invest for eternity instead of just for this earth? Then obviously, verse uh, 24, you can't serve both God and money. Everything about me, all my thought processes were, how do I go from this kind of lower middle class guy and work my way to be somebody powerful, to be somebody wealthy, all that. And you know what? God blesses people with that. Many of you guys have experienced the blessing of God in that journey. I know mil- many millionaires or even a billionaire or two that, that love Jesus more than I do. So it's not about the love of Jesus. It's about the centrality of the money. And so I said, I can't serve God in money. For me, I had to step away from all of it in order to find the kingdom. For some of us, we have the kingdom and God has given us as a blessing. But you can't serve it as if it is God. Then uh, obviously the end of that run is Matthew 6, 25 through 33, where Jesus talks about the cure for anxiety. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or worry about what you're going to wear or worry about what you need. Or God, your Father knows all your needs, but seek first His kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you isn't that awesome so these scriptures capture my heart now then there was the practical outworking so it was between my sophomore and junior year in uh, college and that summer I made more money than I ever had uh, working at an oil refinery made a lot of money and I came back to school and my again my general mo was if I, there's cash in my wallet and they asked and they passed the plate i throw everything in and uh, if somebody asked to borrow anything i let them borrow it without expecting anything in return so i kind of get into the school year i go through this rhythm at the same time um, some friends had initiated with us about going to papua new guinea to reach cannibal tribes people who'd never heard and we said sure we're in and uh, I had never, uh, I didn't know how to raise support or what you were supposed to do or anything like that. So I didn't really tell anybody my needs. I just prayed, well, God told us to go. It'll be there when we need it. So fast forward, we get to the spring of the year. And uh, I have, you know, uh, we've gone through school and everything else. And it's right about finals time. And I'm out of money. And uh, I'd given abundantly. I'd probably given away half of what I made. So let's say I made 5000 in the summer. I'd given away about $2,500. And here I am now. And we need this uh, trip, about $3,000 a person. And then I get a phone call from my mom telling me that I'm $54 short on a rent payment. And, uh, and she said, and my mom was not a believer at the time. And she said, I don't know what you're thinking about God providing for this and that and everything else. You're short and you, you better come up with it by Monday. And I told her uh, in my own uh, young, arrogant, back at you way, uh, I'm following God and he's going to provide. There is, that is true, but I don't know if I had the best attitude about it. So anyway, <laughs> um, so I go to church that next day or go on, the, on, a, on a Sunday night. And uh, well, I got to tell you, what, I'm back up. On that previous Wednesday night, I went to a church service and I had one dollar left to my name. And I mean, to my name, I had a dollar in my pocket. And a buddy comes up to me before the service and gives me 20 bucks. And he said, uh, hey, I know I borrowed 20 bucks from you last semester. Here it is. And I thought, no, they haven't passed the plate yet. Why did you give me the $20? 
they pass the plate. I throw my 21 bucks. Again, I was on the meal plan, so at least I had food. Um, Mom calls on the Saturday. It's now the Sunday that evening. And um, we were, uh, uh, after this, uh, during the service, the pastor said, hey, I want to kind of do a double offering tonight. I want to pass the plate back around. And people just put in for anybody that have, might need, have needs in the congregation. And after the service, the, our associate pastor will just disseminate needs, just like they did in the New Testament. Anybody that has need, you can just go talk to them. And he said, I have a couple of senses from the Lord about needs that are out there, but one of them is somebody has a need of a rent payment about $50. He said, that seems a little awkward to me, but if that's you, just come and respond. Well, remember also, God helps those who help themselves. I had never uh, taken money, received money from anyone for anything. I was always on the giving side or whatever, so I thought, well, that must be for somebody else, right? So after the service, we're meeting with the pastor to talk about our trip to New Guinea because the next Sunday they're going to tell the church and they're going to invest in what we're doing. So as we're meeting with him, I have the, what I call the Holy Spirit sweats. You know what I mean? Like when you're supposed to say something but everything in you doesn't want to. And I just thought, I got to say it, I got to say it. So I tell the pastor, hey, you know, you mentioned something about $50 and if somebody else picked it up, of course, if they need it, that's fine. I don't, you know, I, blah, blah, you know I'm just kind of babbling. He said, well, hey, let me just call over to the other office, ask the associate pastor if anybody brought the $50 or asked for $50 rent. So a few minutes later, the associate pastor walks in and he says this. He said, I, um, I prayed about it and um, I felt like the number was $54 for the rent. But I felt like God said to give you 21 more. Here's $75. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Jesus knows where I live. So now, fast forward the next week. And this is, uh, uh, so I sell all my books, everything else. And um, uh, there's two things going on. Uh, they're, they're supposed to present us to the church. And people are going to give money. And people had already started giving just supernaturally. Money was coming in for this trip. They're supposed to present us before the church. And I've, I've just kind of started dating Laura very seriously. We're supposed to go down. Uh, I'm supposed to go down to her house for a few days before we fly out. She doesn't know I'm poor yet. So, uh, so that's not clear yet. And um, I have a, I sell my books. I have $14. And I have a quarter of a tank of gas. And I got to go from Waco to Houston. And so that puts me at College Station uh, for those Texans out there. But right, when you get out on faith, you just keep going, right? You're, you're out there anyway. Just keep going with it. But I put my wallet underneath my car seat when I get out uh, to, go to, the, to go to the church, going to the church. And the, that little Holy Spirit voice was, aren't you taking your wallet? You always take your wallet. What's different about today? And I'm thinking, I only have $14. I mean, how am I going to do this? And I thought, well, I've come this far. 14 bucks isn't going to carry the day anyway. So I go into the church service, and of course, they pass the plate. I pull out my wallet, put my $14 in. And um, during, the, during the offertory song, I'm standing up just, oh, I love you, Jesus. I'm sure several older ladies saying, look at that sweet boy just loving Jesus. Now, <laughs> It was, it was absolute surrender, desperation. Oh, God, she doesn't know I'm poor. What am I going to do in College Station tonight? You know, so anyway, we get through that. And um, at the end, um, man, people just start coming up to us for our trip, giving us all this money and cash and everything else. We end up having money left over. It was just an abundant blessing for our needs. But the whole time I had my Bible next to me and, and, um, and my buddies can vouch for it. Nobody touched my Bible, saw my Bible. And I'm opening it up looking for a passage of scripture at the end of our time. And there's two crisp $100 bills in there. And my friends as well, they said, nobody put that there, man. That's God. Just, it's the hand of God to take care of whatever needs you have for you and Lord and everything else. And I said, yes, he's not going to know I'm poor until we get married. This is going to be <laughs> great. Now, I tell that whole story to say that many times our return is not immediate. And it may not even be in the exact same way that you wanted it to be returned, if you will. But the sowing into the kingdom, everybody I gave to, everybody I loved in the name of Jesus, couldn't be taken away from me, even if I ended up in college station the rest of my life. God forbid. <laughs> what? So why do we give? 
we give first and foremost out of love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. I love you, Jesus. Whatever's in your heart, I'm in. I I give out of love. We raised our kids on three simple biblical financial truths. And we call it live simply, work diligently, and give generously. If you do all these things, then whatever the future holds for you, you'll be ready for it. Be a hard worker, you'll be diligent, you give generously, you sow into the kingdom, and you live within your means. So we've had a no-debt policy, we've never been in debt for anything. Even though we've had a little at times, God's always given us enough. And so by raising our kids that way, we came to now the college days, right? And our first daughter was going to college, and it was like, well, what are you going to do here, right? She went out to San Diego State her first year because we planted a church out there. She wanted to be a part of that. The only thing is that out-of-state tuition is a lot of money. And so we were, came up about $19,000 short. Now, we've never been in debt for anything. We pay for everything cash. So here we are, back against the wall. And um, uh, so nothing, you know, we, we're not telling people our needs. We're just praying about everything. And, and so, um, but uh, three years previously, a friend had given me a brand new truck. And whenever somebody does something like that, I want to make sure there's no strings attached, right? Because... Um, yeah, that's a whole other story. So he, so he gives me this truck, and, and, and he said, I'm going to give you a truck. I said, bro, you do not need to give me a truck. I'm fine. Except he said, I'm giving you a truck. I'm embarrassed what you're driving around. You need a truck for your kids. And I said, here, the only deal is if you give it to me, I may sell it. You've got to be okay. It's got to be the Lord's truck, or I can't receive it. And, I, and, and he said, great, then it's the Lord's truck. I'm going to get you something, uh, a red truck with uh, black flames on it then. And I said, <laughs> he said, unless you tell me the exact kind you want, the exact color. Okay, I want a white truck, <laughs> so, so forth. So that was the understanding. I had the truck for three years. Now it's college time. And I said, okay, well, I can sell the truck. So I sell the truck, I get enough cash to be able to pay for her college by, by a little something uh, uh, less than that uh, to be able to get around. And I'm just rejoicing. Laura and I are rejoicing that God's provided. And I had so many friends saying to me, what a sacrifice. Oh, what a father you are to give up your truck. And I thought, don't cheapen love. A piece of ju- a truck is no sacrifice for my daughter to be free. She lives simply. She works diligently. She gives you I'm worked in this together. A truck is nothing for love. Don't cheapen it for a truck. It is my joy to give. We give out of love. It's our joy in whatever we give to Jesus. It, we give out of compassion. This takes many forms. Of course, we're being stirred to uh, uh, these days about the plight of world evangelization. I believe the greatest injustice in the world, the greatest injustice of all the unjust causes, is that every person on the planet has not had the ability to hear the gospel and respond to it. That is the greatest injustice. Because if that justice is righted and Jesus becomes Lord through the discipleship process, then all the wrongs will be made right. Hacking at the leaves is not going to work without the gospel being central. So a mood with compassion as Jesus was to bring laborers for the harvest, to invest in the future of all hearing. But it's compassion that draws us as well. I was in a, I was in a church one day, and, and um, after church, I'm just looking around, Holy Spirit, is there anything you're doing? I look at this guy, he looks a little distraught, he's a businessman in our church, a successful businessman from everybody's perspective. Outwardly, he has a lot of resources, and I felt like the Lord said, Go give him $100. Tell him I see and I know. And, you know, my first human thought is, all I have is $100. <laughs> but, of course, immediately, I've been around long enough. Who cares? The guy's hurting. Maybe 100 bucks to encourage him. So $100 is my lot. Went over there, and I said, hey, man, I just want to, felt like the Lord told me to come over and just give you this $100 and let you know that he sees and he knows. As I put that $100 in this very capable type A guy's hands, he begins to cry. Then he begins to sob and he falls into my arms. And he said, how do you know? How do you know? Nobody knows. And I said, what's going on, man? And he said, I'm filing for bankruptcy. He said, I haven't told my wife yet. He said, I made this mistake and that mistake and this mistake. Nobody knows. 
Nobody, everybody thinks I've got it together. Everybody thinks I'm, all these businesses are working. He said, man, I made some mistakes. What do I do? And I said, the first thing you need to know is that God sees and God knows. And this $100 is a down payment for your future because God has a good future for you. Who knows what one act of compassion does? It made him make it right with his family. He made it right with business partners. And he's successful again today. But that one act of compassion unlocks the doors in people's hearts. You never know what a little act of compassion can do to change somebody's life. So if the, if the why is out of love and out of compassion... Kind of what is the, the what of being generous, of, of giving, or, or excuse me, how do we do it? I love this uh, a scripture in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, and 8. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. We give out of love and out of compassion, and then the way that we give is joyfully. Joyfully. Here's what I tell the people in our church. If you are giving begrudgingly, don't give to this church. If you're giving begrudgingly to one of our missionaries working around the world, do not give. Don't give begrudgingly. Give with joy, because we want to build our lives around the joy of the Lord. It's a privilege to share the gospel. It's a privilege to be involved in anything that he's doing. Do it with joy. Because the joy increases with every move you make towards generosity. We uh, um, uh, began our, uh, when we planted the church, and again, just for a little context, we started planting churches in, in Russia, in Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, the unengaged of the world. Then we started our own local church and hubbed that out of Waco, Texas. So after 10 years of planting churches around the world, we started our own local fellowship for, uh, to be a hub uh, in Waco, and we moved into the inner city because we said, if we're going to reach the world, we got to reach our neighbor. And so we moved into the inner city and uh, bought an uh, abandoned grocery store that hadn't been inhabited in 10 years except by drug addicts and prostitution, prostitutes. Um, but we, we cleaned that out, and we were doing the rebuild. Now, remember I told you we'd never been in debt, so that's the way we were going to run the church, debt-free. We either do this or we don't. And so it was one of the first big giving days for us to begin the process of doing this first building project debt-free. So people not only brought money, but they brought resources. They brought computers and diamond rings, and in those days bought mink coats because they were actually worth something. And um, they, they brought whatever they had. So we had these huge tables. People were driving cars up. I mean, it was just so much fun. The joy of seeing people be a part of something and contending for uh, our establishment there in that city to reach the inner city was beautiful. So, but someone called me right before the service, and they said, hey, we, we had uh, some, uh, some stocks that we cashed in, and it's about $20,000 we were excited to give to the building project, but God put it in our hearts to give to a couple uh, who's trying to get out to the mission field, but they have $20,000 in debt, and we have a policy, you need to get your debt eradicated before you go. And they said, we just feel compelled to do it. And they were so honoring. And they said, hey, we just want to submit back to you. Could we give it to them instead? And I said, absolutely. Why would I think that God doesn't have enough? What, what, what's another 20,000? What's another 20 million? If, if God's leading you to do that, to set somebody free, set them free. There will always be enough for whatever we're doing. So we go through this day, everybody's celebrating, we, we, had, we did it outside in the front of the parking lot, it's a beautiful day, it is just awesome, and I waited till the very end, and, I, and I, I saw that couple in the back, and I said, oh yeah, by the way, before we go, Noah and Amy, your debt is gone, you, you're erratic, you're free, you can go do whatever God wants, and they're like, what, what are you talking about? I said, somebody just gave, they had, they had 19000 and some change. I said, somebody just gave $20,000 so that you can be free to go to the will of the Lord. And if you thought the joy was at one level, you should have seen it, man. Even if you're not a charismatic, you would have been dancing. It was awesome. 
the joy of giving. And you've been in those moments, right, when we rallied around a, a family and, and gave hundreds if not thousands of dollars and saw them set free. The joy, one guarantee where the Spirit of God will always show up is in giving. It's the same thing in encouraging, same thing about talking about the name of Jesus. God shows up every time. When that kind of joy-filled giving is happening, we give joyfully, we give obediently. We give obediently. Again, for time's sake, let me just briefly run through a familiar passage. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. And I love this one. Then I will rebuke the devourer. Devourer, and the nations will call you blessed. Isn't that great? Isn't that awesome? Listen, many of you guys may have different interpretations of this, that, and the other, but here's what, how Laura and I took it. We kind of looked at, looked at the background and said, okay, they were giving a tithe, 10% to the storehouse, so we have always given 10% of every dollar comes in our house to our local church, wherever that is. And then we said, all right, the, other, the offerings added up to about 13%. So we said, all right, another 13% goes to missionaries to work around the world. That's our systematic giving. That's the Old Testament low bar. <laughs> So 23%, when we made $6,000, we did this. It didn't matter the dollar figure, so no matter how that, this is just a given. This is managed giving. So we're going to do the low bar there. But New Testament giving is everything's the Lord's. <laughs> so then that just tees us up for spontaneous response to the Spirit of God. To give abundantly. And no matter how big our needs have been, no matter how big the challenges have been, uh, and they have been great at times, we've never backed off of abundant giving because it's in our sowing that we are providing for the future, not in our taking. And so that journey's been amazing, um, and I've had a chance to talk to so many groups of people. I was invited a few years ago by some of you guys in this room to sit down with a group of, of, of men at the time. There were about 20 men there, 25 men. Uh, who I believe had given a million dollars in the last year, um, to, uh, either out of their foundation, their personal money, and it was me telling wild stories and then us doing a Q and A. I thought it was so funny. You know, I had like three dollars in my pocket to my name, and I'm talking to these multimillionaires about giving. So, but I think the reason they brought me in is I don't want their money. I want their heart. I'm not asking them for anything. Actually, I won't ask them for anything. My desire is to challenge them in their walk with Jesus. So we do the 20 minutes, and then it was question and answer. We ended up going for two hours. Because as you could suspect, it went from dollars to heart to family. Always. What's my true inheritance? What am I leaving to my kids more than money? What does life really look like? But here was the question. Here's how it started. It started with this. The, the first guy asked this question. He said, um, hey, I gave, you know, we gave X amount of dollars last year. Basically, what's enough? One person gives 20%, double tied. Somebody gives 30. I heard of somebody else gave 90%. What's enough? Next guy asked the same kind of question. Next guy asked the same kind of question. And I, after three questions, I called timeout. I said, timeout. In all love to you guys, this is what you're asking. You're asking, what amount of money is going to justify me before God? What amount of giving, stewardship, is going to justify me before God? And I said, let me tell you something, nothing. You're justified before God by the blood of Jesus alone, not by any acts or works that you do. You're not proving anything to God with what you give with your money. This is not about that. You are justified by the grace of God alone. So you are saved. You're good to go for heaven. You are loved by God because he can't be anything but loving to you. So you're loved. You're saved. No justification. Now what you're called to do, though, is then out of your love and submission to him is obey him. And what you're also asking me is, hey, can you just tell me the principles so I don't have to hear God? Can I just say that again? Could somebody... In generous giving or NCF or in Jesus' film, can somebody just tell me the principles so I don't have to hear God? If your heart is disengaged, your money will eventually be disengaged. You have to engage your heart, and it's by the Spirit of the Lord. God, what are you moving me to compassion to do? Spirit of God, what should we do in this moment? How should we 
obey. It's obedience that the followers of Jesus are known for. That's what allows the life of God to be made manifest. And I love how the scripture says, test me in this and see if I will not do above and beyond it, you could ask or think. I don't know how many times uh, Laura and I have just looked at each other and said, what's God saying? Let's do it. Whether it made sense or didn't make sense, whether, you know, all the nickels and noses added up or not. Obedience. So one of my challenges for you in this room is you are challenged today in so many different ways. You need to just say, Holy Spirit, what do we do? Of course, agreement in your home and just do it with all your heart. The last one we give joyfully, we give obediently, and we give sacrificially. This is where the fun stuff is. It's one thing to give consistently just out of love for others. It's another thing to say, okay, God, I'll obey you, I'll obey whatever you want. And then it's the next level to do it sacrificially. It is my joy to sacrifice. I love uh, Jonathan Livingston, the great missionary, was speaking at Cambridge University, talking, and he was telling the stories of the death of a spouse and a child and the challenges of living in Africa and all that he was doing. And uh, it's David Livingston, sorry, not Jonathan. Uh, and um, and he, uh, they said, oh, what sacrifice you have given. And he said, sacrifice? There's no sacrifice. It's my joy for the glory of Jesus. That's, that's where we want to get to in our giving. My, some of my favorite people in the New Testament are the, are the Macedonians. Here's what it says in 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which was given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberal, liberality. This is why I always call everybody to give. Out of their deep need, they gave joyfully. And it said, for I testified that according to their ability and beyond their ability. When have you gone beyond your ability? And beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this, not as we had expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then one another by the will of God. Woo! If you want to be known about it, you want to be a Macedonian. <laughs> Wherever you are, and you say, well, you know, there's other people in the room that make more money than me. Who cares? You don't stand before everybody else in the room. You stand before God. And your participation matters, and your seat is as important as anybody else's seat. One person's a million dollars, another person's ten million, is another person's ten dollars. God is looking for the sacrifice that he can work with for his glory. This became apparent to Laura and I when we first were married and we started going on this journey. We chose what we called a George Mueller lifestyle. We're not going to tell anybody our needs. We'll work as much as we can in the secular world, do as much ministry as we can. That's kind of how we started off. And um, so a lot of times there wasn't much. We were committed to no debt, etc. And the, the, a, uh, at our church, they had what's called a YWAM night of missions. They would come and kind of recruit people, talk about missions. And the deal was you'd have people stay in your home. You'd make them a brown bag lunch for the next day and send them on their way. Well, Laura and I didn't have any, we had $20 left to our name. We had a $100 bill due on a Monday, and this was a Saturday night. Um, and um, so we take somebody in our home. It was great. And uh, this guy was a really great guy. He felt called to Brazil. Um, uh, that night we're talking with him, and he's saying, yeah, I feel really called to Brazil. And I said, well, what's the support for you going to be? Or he said, hey, I need $3,000 to get down there. And Laura and I, he goes to the restroom or something. We said, man, I, we would really love to give. I mean, what can we do? And I said, we got 20 bucks. That's what we've got. And she, of course, with me said, well, let's do it. Why not? Let's be a part and pray that God would multiply this little bit we have. So he comes back in the room and we say, man, we are so excited to believe with you for this 3000 And we said, I'm so sorry, man. I wish we could give more. We've got 20 that we can give. Can we put this in your hand, pray over it, ask God to multiply it to provide your need? And he said, oh, guys, you don't need to, no, they said, we don't, no, we don't need to do it. We want to do it. It is our joy to do it. Please let us be involved and, and trust God with you. So we give him the 20 bucks. We pray over that 20 bucks. And then uh, 
we're done, right? So that night, he gets up the next morning, we get a little breakfast for him, he's out the door rejoicing, we hug and all that good stuff. Go back into the room to kind of clean up where he had been staying, and there's a thank you note on the bed. I said, oh, way to go, YWAM guy, Did thank you note. And so I uh, pull out thank you note, and he writes all of these thoughts, and he says, and it says this, he said, as I was praying this morning, God showed me that your need was greater than my need, and to leave you $100. Thank you for your faith towards God. I know he'll provide for me. Isn't that beautiful? It's not the dollar figure. It's the joy. It's the obedience. It's the sacrifice. But at that sacrificial level, you get out there in faith, and you find God to be faithful. If you've never been out there, I encourage you to get out there. Get beyond your ability so that your hope and trust is in Jesus alone. And it'll set you free, even if it set, even as it sets others free. Remember, the kingdom is always a two-edged sword. The giver gets blessed both ways. Let God set you free today by the Holy Spirit. As a response in this next couple of moments, if you could just, why don't we all stand together here just a moment and stay with me here because please just hear me. What's most important, hey, we've had good worship. Hopefully the word helped you this morning, but it's your response to God right now that's the make or break of this whole deal. It's not just the preaching, it's the response to the word that bears fruit, 30, 60, and 100 fold or not. So, I want us to just take us in a moment of response to Jesus right now. Again, if you're comfortable, just close your eyes. The only reason I do that, and actually the only reason we do music, it's not to manipulate, it's to help you focus. Because in these moments, you have a window to focus on Jesus. Don't miss this moment. So here we go. So Jesus, we focus on you right now. We just open our hands again. Again, you might want to do that just as a place of surrender where you've been gripping finances and you've been gripping out of fear of the future you might just want to open your hands and let go again it's open hands that God fills not closed hands so Lord we open our hands again to you today first and foremost to say we love you you've given us life and breath and everything we have from you we just give it back to you with this open hands it's all yours Lord I'm yours my family's yours my resources yours. my life's yours we love you. We trust you. We reach out as a simple child, reaching out to the arms of their father again this morning. We say, we trust you. And as you're reaching out to the father this morning, I know that there are physical needs. I know there's emotional trauma going on. I know there's sicknesses you're wondering if you're going to get out of. I know that there's family troubles. Man, just put them in the hands of Jesus. In your mind's eye, as you open your hands, just put them in the hands of Jesus. Just see him in your mind's eye, just receiving your burdens. He's the burden bearer. So we give you those burdens again this morning. And we ask, Holy Spirit, we give you freedom this morning to begin to speak to us in every area of our lives, individually and as couples. We pray for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We pray, oh God, we would be a people set free in every direction, in every way so that we might truly reflect your glory wherever we go. Oh Lord, I declare again today that your desire is above and beyond all that we could ask or think. So Spirit of the living God, pour out above and beyond. Speak in a hundred different ways for every need in this room. And Lord, Jesus, pull us into what you're wanting to do through this gathering this weekend so that all will hear and all will know in our lifetime. Let the joy of the expectation of heaven be in our hearts all morning long, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.